Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Martha Crawford, Dean of the Jack Welch College of Business and Technology, calling in from West Campus in the newly renovated GE, uh, former GE World Headquarters. And it is my pleasure to lead this discussion uh, this afternoon and to introduce you to three amazing women uh, who are directly associated with the Welch College of Business and Technology. And I want to invite them uh, to introduce themselves very briefly, and then we'll get into a discussion about uh, sort of how this theme, Choose to Challenge, that's the theme of uh, the Women's Day, Women's Month uh, this year, how it applies to their lives and, and what, uh, when we reflect uh, what, what it means going forward. Uh, but first, the, just a, a, a very quick uh, word from me. We are so proud uh, to have with us today Sharda Cherwu, who is uh, an alumna. She did her BS in accounting, uh, graduating in 1982 from Sacred Heart. And um, she has had a distinguished career, 37-year uh, career with uh, Ernst & Young, and has done amazing things there, and now sits on the board of directors of uh, the World Fuel Services Corporation and Land of Lakes. And I will invite her to say a, a word of introduction uh, about her own career in a second. Secondly, we have uh, Elaine Hughes, who uh, is also an alumna. She did her MBA graduating in 1980 uh, with Sacred Heart. And uh, Elaine was, uh, uh, has had a distinguished career in, um, in human resources, but she started off in the textile industry and she'll tell us a little bit about that. Uh, she is also uh, a board member of uh, JDRF and she's a former board member of the Baseball Express catalog as well. And then finally, last but certainly not least, uh, we have Sarina Masia, whose daughter, Isabella, is a freshman in the Welsh College of Business and Technology, class of 23. And uh, Isabella, uh, sorry, uh, Sarina, uh, Isabella's mom, uh, is joining us today, uh, has had a, uh, also an amazing career uh, in the financial services industry. Uh, she hails from Switzerland and Australia. Uh, she is the uh, CEO and founder of Join Insurance and is a member of the board of directors of Credit Suisse since 2015 and also a, chair, a chairwoman of the board of Banku. Uh, and sits also on the, she's the chair actually of the board of the Food Bank of New York City. So please join me uh, in, in welcoming these ladies to the Welch College of Business and Technology, uh, where we're delighted to hear about your story. So I, I will ask uh, each of them in turn, Sharda and then Elaine and then Sarina, just to say a few words of introduction uh, when they um, look back on their career, how this, how this idea of uh, choose to challenge applies when they look back at their career thus far. Sharda, over to you. I actually uh, grew up in India. I um, moved here from India back in 77 and um, sort of grew up in a, in a family that was very, you know, my, my dad was all about um, working hard, seeing no boundaries. My, my mom was, is, who lives with us, is very much about, um, you know, relationships, selflessness, and, 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 and just constantly giving uh, without expecting anything in return. So, so with that backdrop, Landing up in the U.S. Uh, in '77 uh, as, as a married woman from India, um, I uh, sort of saw a new world, and and I think this this combination of just my family background and, and the world in in the U.S. and um, it was just, I think this is just done wonders for for the way I, I think and the way I connect, etc. But just going back to my career, right after Sacred Heart, um, I uh, joined Ernst and uh, Winnie at the time, and have had um, you know a, a wonderful career at EY. Uh, just retired last year uh, as a partner. Um, you know, partners are supposed to retire at uh, 60. It's mandatory. So um, as I look back, uh, I just feel very blessed about um, all the things that I've uh, seen and, and been um, interacted with, you know, all the clients, all the people around the world. In fact, Elaine got introduced to me by one of my uh, ex-clients, which is just wonderful. So, uh, you know, more to come later. I'm going to keep this brief, but uh, thank you so much. And um, I'm so happy to be with uh, this panel. Um, I am a graduate of the MBA program uh, at Sacred Heart, which frankly was in its infancy stage when I was accepted into the program, I believe it was 1978. Um, it, the program was only two years old. 
Um, I began my career, I'm from a small town that some of you may have heard of, it's called Brooklyn, New York. And um, uh, it was a wonderful place to grow up. You learned very quickly how to get along with a lot of people in a small space. And in that, um, uh, I would have to say, uh, acquired a level of, of confidence, um, of the ability to uh, pursue. And in that, um, that certainly helped me in my, my career. So uh, in 1976, I was hired on as the first woman in textile sales at Springs Industries, which was a publicly traded domestic textile business. They are the ones that sponsored me for my MBA. I began my MBA at Pace University, but in 1977, as Sharda also arrived in Southern Fairfield County, my husband, Frank Hughes, my late husband, Frank Hughes and I, arrived in Fairfield uh, for his career. He had worked in Greenwich. Um, and uh, it was became very apparent to me after two years of pursuing my MBA that I could no longer commute at night and I needed to transfer my credits to a university in Connecticut. The only one that would accept Pace University credits was this new program at Sacred Heart. And it was a wonderful program. I enjoyed it, uh, made a lot of friends in the school. And then um, in 1982, I realized that there wasn't much of a future in the textile business. And by 1983, had the opportunity to uh, join a small uh, recruiting firm in New York. And I did so. And in 1991, I founded EA Hughes and Company. Uh, we are an, an executive search firm specializing in uh, the consumer product space. Uh, two years ago, uh, I sold my company uh, to a much larger global firm by the name of Solomon Page. And I now continue to run what was my own business but under their umbrella. Thank you, Martha, uh, for hosting uh, this, this panel and Elaine and Charlotte, it's great to be uh, with you today. Um, so we are a family of seven and we have four go uh, girls and a boy. And as you said, Martha, we have one of our daughters here at uh, Isabella. At, uh, she's actually a sophomore at Sacred Heart and we're, we're thrilled that she's uh, part of such a great uh, school. I know I'm totally embarrassing her now talking about her. So I'll switch, uh, I'll switch gears and tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so I was born and raised in, um, in Switzerland and I've really had a very unexpected and unlikely career. You know, growing up in Switzerland, I, you know, you really kind of want to go into three areas. Either it's chocolate, it's banking or watches. And I ended up uh, in the insurance industry. And it was really actually by accident. And it's it's a funny story. I feel like it was destiny because I um, I applied for a position uh, in a in an uh, in an advertisement that was uh, that said, "Do you want to travel the world and do you want to experience first class training?" And you know, it said, and it just shows how times have changed. It said you needed to be 25 years of age and you needed to have your college degree completed. I hadn't completed my college degrees at the time, and I wasn't 25, but I still applied, and I ended up getting the job. And it wasn't in it wasn't in in banking, chocolate, or or watch it, but it was it was in insurance. And it turned out the reason why I was even invited to go through the interview process and ended up being hired by this insurance company, which is a large global insurance company, was because the, the person who was hiring was looking at the resumes on uh, on his terrace. And uh, he was taking them out and looking at all the different resumes and studying them. And when he took out my resume, a bird flew by and chat on my resume. So they decided no matter what the, who the person was, they're going to invite her through the interview process. And so I ended up starting my career in insurance industry instead of those other three industry. And I will look back at, I'm looking back at, you know, 30 something years uh, in that industry. And I've just had a great ride. I've worked in a number of different uh, locations in various different leadership roles, um, including, you know, Australia, uh, Hong Kong, the UK, obviously Switzerland and the US. And I will tell you, growing up in, in, in Switzerland, I really never had, it never even occurred to me that I would become a CEO because there were no there were no role models, so I just even think that I had an opportunity to uh, to have such a career. And there were also a lot of cultural barriers, and uh, I'm sure we'll get into that 
later, but ultimately I, you know, I ended up running businesses that were as large as, you know, $12 billion in revenue, 20,000 people uh, reporting into me. And now today I'm doing something completely different. I recently stepped out of the large corporate role, became an entrepreneur, and I've just founded my own insurance company that is really focused on bringing modern technology and data and analytics and all that great stuff to the insurance experience. And again, I look forward to, thank you for having me and uh, look forward to our conversation. Uh, so I wanted just to uh, kind of, I mean, I think this is an amazing opportunity for our uh, younger, for our students who are listening, uh, whether male or female, just to hear these stories and to, uh, to understand sort of what were the journeys of these individuals and how does this idea of choosing to challenge uh, what does what does that mean in the context of these careers? I mean, why why is that a pick? Why is that the theme of, of the Women's Day uh, this year? And I think you know if you unpack it, what does choose to challenge mean? You know, you choose to challenge yourself. Uh, we've just heard that um, you know Sharda left her her home country of India as a teenager and, and moved uh, here to Connecticut. Uh, Sarina, uh, ex, you know. Ex, chose to challenge the idea that, well, maybe I'm not fully qualified, but I'm still going to, you know, according to what they've written, but I'm still going to apply. Uh, e Elaine chose to challenge by going into the textile industry, uh, but not only challenging yourself, but also institutions, right? Because don't forget uh, what we've just heard is that 30 some years ago, uh, in, in some respects, women were not necessarily very uh, welcome in these institutions. Uh, in some of these places. So I, I wanted to start uh, but with that thought um, of, you know, sort of, it, and again, I'll, I'll start with Sarina because she was just up. I mean, when you look back at your career thus far, you know, how is Choose to Challenge relevant? Uh, and, and, you know, would you say that the biggest way you chose to challenge was challenging yourself or institutions or others around you? Thank you, Martha. That's a great question. So I, it's a hugely important topic, you know, choose to challenge and both, you know, the institution and yourself. But I actually think it does start with yourself. And I've kind of always looked at it uh, from that perspective in my career. And I have a couple of examples uh, where really uh, where I didn't have the courage to challenge myself, but I learned from it. And so when I was early in my career, uh, I was a senior officer for uh, Zurich Insurance, uh, 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 responsible for investor relations and rating agencies. And um, I was, uh, Zurich had an American CEO, so Switzerland was still very, um, uh, it was hard to have a career in Switzerland, but um, Zurich had an American CEO and the opportunity came up for promotion for me, but I was actually pregnant with uh, with my uh, first daughter and so you know the, the people in switzerland would tell tell the ceo forget about Sarina. she's not going to come back she's going to have her baby and that was kind of how uh, things worked back then and and he ended up saying no 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 i'm, I'm you know i believe in Sarina. he offered me the promotion and i i didn't have the courage to challenge myself i didn't feel like i was ready for that job so i actually turned the job down um, and then when I came back from maternity leave, the person that they had put in charge was a complete disaster. And uh, it was, um, uh, you know, within about eight months of me returning from maternity leave, uh, you know, the, 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 my boss and the organization decided to part ways. And when then the opportunity came up again for me to take on that leadership role, I then the second time uh, took it. And so it was really, I didn't challenge myself enough the first time round, And then the second time I, I took on the challenge and that led actually sort of the path to my big breakthrough as my first CEO role. When I was, I was moved over to the US as a CFO of one of the larger businesses that Zurich uh, had. And uh, within eight, within about eight months of me being that CFO role, the the person who ran the business was retiring and that same american ceo came to me and said sarina you've kind of never disappointed us um and you know we feel like you're ready to take on that new challenge i was in my late 30s uh, at that time and it was a pretty big business and i didn't really feel ready for the role i felt totally uh, you know, not prepared for it, but because of my prior experience for not having had the courage to take on that challenge. 
um, I actually took on that uh, took on that CEO role. It was a two and a half billion dollar business. I was seven months pregnant with my son at the time, so it was kind of a shock for the organization that they would even promote someone, uh, you know, at, at at that stage to such a big role. And um, and that really actually uh, sort of um, laid the foundation for all my future leadership roles and 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 all the CEO roles that came after that. But I really had to push myself uh, to accept the challenge. Um, Elaine, I wondered, you know, as an HR, you know, someone who's, who's spent most of her career working in, in human resources and, and recruiting, uh, when, when you look at risk taking in women, uh, you know, would you encourage women to take risky roles at early stages in their career, uh, like, like the one that Sarina just, uh, just explained she did? Oh, well, I think Sarina was um, extraordinarily brave in her approach. Um, to these opportunities. Um, but I think, um, what I want to clarify something though in your explanation. Um, um, I'm really not a human resource professional. I come out of sales and marketing and um, executive search is more about the um, research and identification of talent and then the ability to know enough about an industry to uh, recruit the right people, most of the time sitting in other positions um, to go into your client organization. So in terms of risk, um, I would say that um, early in your career, um, when I started recruiting, I was 28 years old. So the worst scenario that could have happened is after a year or two, I wasn't successful. The bigger risk, is when you work for a corporation, um, you do have a salary, you have money, you have benefits coming in. Um, my own personal risk is I had none of that and nor did I also had my first child and didn't have family support to help me um, in the care of, of that child. So, um, you know, I think when a young woman or a young man looks at risk, you have to balance what your situation is and um, actually look at it in a way to say, um, what, what do I have supporting me in that decision making to take that risk? And, um, and some of that risk is financial. Some of it has to do with family. Um, and um, you, you have to really, you know, truly weigh those options. But what I say to young people um, that come to me, or if I get involved in a panel discussion, is I like to use the word um, runway, like an airplane. So the younger you are, the longer your runway is, and you can afford to make mistakes. And frankly, the best executives that I've ever met or interviewed in my career um, at some point in their career, they failed and they learned from that experience and they make sure the next time they don't fail. And um, I think that is that is very critical. Fascinating. Yes. Well, thank you for the reminder. Yes, absolutely. The best uh, recruiters must know the business they're recruiting for. So obviously a background in sales and marketing is, is key for that. Uh, fascinating also the idea of runway and that, yeah, it, it would make a ton of sense to take risks, of course, calculated risks, weighed risk, but nonetheless risks early in your career so that you you have the most runway to recover in case uh, it's a failure and you can convert it into something else. Uh, Sharda, what's the most important risk that you took and, and why? Uh, as I look back, um over my career at EY, I'm just backing up a bit, you know, landing up um, from India in the US. And, um, you know, my, my first opportunity was um, actually at a, at a grocery store. My first job was at, at a grocery store. I could walk there. We didn't have a car. So that was my uh, the, the only place I could really work. That was before my Sacred Heart days. And, you know, what was fascinating is um, there was when you don't grow up in a culture, uh, and I'm sure um, Serena's experience this as well, is when you don't grow up in the system, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn. So I was just just learning the basics in the in the in cities where I worked in Scarsdale. Uh, you know, in hey, you know, where's the shark, the bounty? I didn't even know. About. So so with that context, and also. Um, 
you know, the whole choosing to challenge and, and the risk taking, uh, taking lots and lots of risks. But that, that was very driven uh, as I think about why I did what I did was from this deep desire to con just curiosity and just continuing to learn. So, um, you know, my career at EY, um, so I sort of, it was, uh, was taking different risks and, you know, people look back and say, how could you have ever done that? But I chose every five or six years, every four, five, six years, I uh, completely changed what I was doing at EY. So I started off as an auditor and did my audit bid sort of enjoyed it. There was a lot of different things and there was pre-Excel. So it was, it was very manual and the, 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 there was a lot of grunt work associated with that at the time. But then I decided I wanted to sort of learn more and do more. So I uh, moved into tax and, and tax consulting at the time. Uh, you know, I was in a lawyer tax background. So I was sort of starting from ground zero and, and I learned tax and sort of did pretty well in tax. Um, I then, a bunch of years later, came up with the idea that we wanted to set up, uh, we should at EY set up a, a shared service center that could do, uh, it would be beneficial for the firm for a number of different reasons. And I was the architect of setting that up as a CEO of that, and that's 25,000 people now in five countries who did that. Um, I then moved to private equity. Um, and with M&A, and in those days, I mean, you didn't, there was no other, uh, they picked about 21 partners to, to serve private equity clients, and I was one of one woman, and, um, and trying to serve private equity when I knew very little about private equity was, uh, it was again, a challenge, a challenge for me to learn and, and, and start. Uh, I'm sure I knew a lot less than everybody else. And the bookend of my career, again, was a, a fascinating. When I look back and say the last five uh, years at EY, um, I came up with the idea of, hey, you know what? Robotic process automation is thriving. There's a lot there. There's machine learning. There's all this data and all that stuff that needs to get done. And um, I went to our board and said, well, this is something that we should invest in. And uh, there was a lot of trust in the system, and, and lo and behold, I was leading digital transformation for Ernst & Young in the Americas, and this is, you know, with 40,000 people around uh, the U.S. And, and coming and doing stuff that no one at EY had done before. In fact, I was talking about what needed to get done. You know, most of the board members around the table at EY were... Uh, you know, we're asking questions like, how do you spell RPA? What are you talking about? So so the whole point, uh, I think, of this whole thing is I've uh, systematically, and at the time, I didn't think those those were risks at all. I, I was just driven by curiosity and change. I think I thrive on change. As I look back, back, it's like if things aren't changing, I don't feel comfortable. I just feel very comfortable with change. And, and, and that's sort of what's driven me throughout my career. Or, or even when I look back and say, when I made partner when I was 31 years old um, at, at, in the Stanford, Connecticut office, there was no woman who had ever made partner in, in the office, right? Um, in the Stanford office. At the time, I didn't feel as much, it, it was different or there was a, uh, but, so, but so much about risk taking is also about people around you in the ecosystem. Um, of trust that you develop that 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 allows you allows other people around you to to invest in you and, and help you succeed. Uh, I'm a big believer in you. You have to create an ecosystem for people to help you succeed, or even pick you up when you're failing, so that you can you know stand up again and and to Elaine's point, do something uh, the next time around uh, that will help you learn more. So that's sort of been my life journey of sort of, uh, I wouldn't say risk taking, but just change and doing different things and starting from kindergarten every five, six years again to learn something totally new. You've, uh, so clearly you've, you've embraced change, uh, you've, you've kept learning, uh, you've, you've had that very um, you know, proactive attitude. But nonetheless, even if we accept challenges, even if we're ready to take risks, we definitely still meet obstacles, right? And sometimes we have naysayers. Sometimes we have people who stand up and, yeah, sure, you, you pitch to the board that, hey, I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, and then you've got people who stand in your way and say, say no, uh, I, I don't share that point of view, or, or people who work against you. 
Uh, so how do you overcome those obstacles is, is another question. Uh, you know, and sure, part of it is creating a nice ecosystem, but what about, uh, have, have you had that experience of, of running into naysayers and people who try to hold you back, Sharda? Plen plenty of that. But, but, but I think what it is is, yeah, I mean, I'll give you uh, it's like pl plenty of those examples, but I'll, I'll give you, I think, one that's turned out to be phenomenal for the firm, uh, billions of dollars of for the firm. Uh, and this was back 20 years ago, right? And I and, um, uh, was working on a bunch of different things, and I came up with the idea of, hey, you know what, we really need to figure out how we... Um, you know, create offshore shared services to help, uh, you know, get 24 seven, um, et and obviously save, et cetera. And what was interesting is we started this whole thing planning for it before 9-11. And um, I, we were supposed to fly to, and, and the, the plan was to set up this sh shared service in India. And uh, our flight was scheduled for September 18th that year. Um, and but we'd been planning for it before. And uh, so September uh, 11th uh, hit and, and you know, we were all here in New York. I mean, everything was literally falling apart. You know, we, we, no one had the mind to do anything. So even though we had embarked on the fact that we were going to do this in, in uh, set this thing up in, in India, um, uh, the, the, no, <laughs> everyone was, backing away right so i got we got i got a lot of calls saying you know what i'm not sure this makes any sense this makes sense anymore you know we have just so much to worry about here in the us you know to think of setting up something outside the us and um you know lots and lots of sort of undertones of resistance at the point and and in my and I think that's maybe where the, where the ecosystem helped, but also, you know, you know, my, my pitch was very simple. So, you know, we've, we've spent six months planning for this thing. We worked out the details. We know the value it can provide. And this was, uh, again, 20 years ago, right? We, we can't be daunted by <laughs> people, by, by terrorists or who, who did something horrible uh, it, it just, wh wh why would we back away? Uh, wh why wh why does that sort of stop us? You know, in fact, that should, you know, egg us on and, and, and make us do this. So so reluctantly, in fact, I got, we, my husband and I were at the airport on the 18th and we got calls again saying, are you sure you want to get on the plane? Are you sure? You uh, anyway, so we, we landed there. But again, a year later, there was a lot of India, Pakistan, uh, sort of gyrations, war stuff. Uh, Amex was sending expats back. Um, a lot, lot, lot of companies that were there. GE was sending expats back. They were just getting planes to transport uh, expats back from from India to, to back to the U.S. And I got a call saying, you know, shut the thing down, shut the place down. Uh, this is going to be a war zone, and we don't we don't want to be in the midst of all that stuff. I know we've started and everything else. And again, I had to sort of go back and say, well, you know. I just hired another hundred people. Uh, we, we, we have, an, you know, 200 people here now. What am I going to tell them? Shut the place down. I'm going to go back. Uh, happen, right, precautions, et cetera. But long story short, I mean, if it hadn't been for, for, for me, you know, pushing and, and it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to start up a shared service. First of all, no other big eight firm had taken a frontline piece of our business, uh, of their business, and done it in, in India at the time, right? Uh, so this wasn't back office uh, shared services. This was front office. So so that was, um, anyway, long story short, we have 25,000 in, in, uh, people, more than 25,000 people in five countries now. And it's it's a big uh, sort of crown jewel for, for EY. And um, yeah, so you always get this stuff. And, and the, the point is, if you can make an, a logical argument, and obviously people trusted me to, to make it happen, um, that was a big thing. Uh, you have to stay the course. I mean, to me, persistence and focus and being able to, uh, you know, put the hard work in that it takes um, to, and not things don't always work out, but, but at least giving it your best try is, is so critical. And that's what I said. Let's give it our best try. If it fails, it fails. But but just let's not cut cut our legs off so early in in the game here. 
So fascinating. Right, Thank you. So, so if I resume, you're saying, yeah, the ecosystem that I built up by going from post to post, but keeping all that those contacts, that network within the company, built up this reservoir of of, of trust. And and then I was ready, I was ready to stay the course because of my own tenacity and daring. Uh, but others were trusting me because it, I was staying uh, steady with with our principles and with our commitment. I, I love that story. It's I, I it's it's a it's a great testament not only to you but also to uh, to your company. I think uh, to allow that to, to go forward, even though the other the other large accounting firms were not. Um, Elaine, when when you hear such a story, uh, do do you think of similar obstacles that that you've faced that you've had to overcome? What resonates? You know, I was thinking of something humorous to say when you, the one of the questions is, has things changed for uh, women, you know, since I began my career and I was, my comment was, yes, we got the vote. Um, but um, I will say uh, to Sharda's uh, story, as well as Serena, for all um, the young people that are listening, um, I have certainly prided myself on being an entrepreneur for well over 30 years in a 40 year career. But both Sharda and Serena, if I look at things like a sports event, I see myself that I am in the stands and these two ladies were on the playing field in large complex organizations, which already had some predetermined ideas about um, what a woman can do and what she couldn't do. To Serena's point of having children and the immediate thoughts that come to mind that saying, well, the child, the family, the child is gonna come first. She's not gonna be devoted to her career or give it the attention. And I'm sure Sharda saw those things, but also um, facing these obstacles and understanding and have enough knowledge of what your skill set is to maneuver and influence in an organization. And I would have to say to another conversation we're going to have is, um, well, that is one of the great things women do. Women have the ability to collaborate and to influence. And certainly in times of crisis, as we have seen this past year in COVID, the leadership of businesses um, uh, the with female leadership in businesses um, has been absolutely uh, extraordinary. But yes, there, there are obstacles. Um, I think generationally, there's going to be less obstacles going forward. Um, one of the key th changes I see, uh, particularly for women, is um, access to information. The information and the data available today was not available in 1975. Um, to Serena's point in Switzerland, where was my role model? We didn't have it back then. We have all those things right now. So I look at it this way. Um, you can aspire to whatever you want. There are no excuses. There's the information. Um, there are plenty of people that have overcome, particularly women, obstacles to reach the C-suite in organizations. There's also number two, there's been a generational shift. Um, the young men today, I see, they think of women more on an equal playing field and do not look at women as somebody that needs to stay in the household or uh, whose talents are, are any less than their own. And the other key thing, believe it or not, is something that we ignore. I think this year, um, nobody's ignoring it, but health. And there is an attention to health and wellness. Um, I would say 30 years ago that women didn't pay attention to. And there are a number of initiatives um, and there are great women, you know, such like uh, the late Evelyn Lauder, who uh, uh, with you know, Memorial Sloan Kettering has an attestment to 30 years of her effort uh, to work towards women's health. So you put all those things together, um, the access to information, the equality generationally and the issues that we no longer have when it comes to health. And to me, um, there, is, there is the ability to, to achieve what your desires are. And not every desire is to be the CEO of a company, but to um, have what I call the three goods, a good company, good people to work with, and hopefully a good amount of money that you're earning. Yeah. 
Excellent. Uh, thank you. Yeah, very interesting. That it, so you're quite positive. Um, Elaine sees that you know it's a it, that women uh, entering the workforce today have role models. They they are they're encountering more open frames of mind and have more access to information. So it sounds quite quite hopeful. I wonder, uh, Serena, um, during your career, have have you seen that things have changed a lot uh, or in, in important ways for women? And when you look at your uh, children who are entering the workforce, in particular. Uh, the, the, your daughters, uh, do you think that they will face similar challenges to the ones that you reached, that you faced, sorry, in reaching your level of success today? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I think, uh, you know, a great deal has uh, has changed. One, you know, it's great that we're even talking about uh, gender parity. It wasn't even a discussion topic when I started my career uh, 30 years ago, but you know, more importantly, there's been a lot of research which actually shows that companies that have women on their boards or in executive roles outperform companies that are less diverse. And, and actually, it's not just in the corporate world, uh, you know, that diversity of thought is sort of, I think it's a well-accepted view today that with that diversity of thought, you have a better outcome. And, you know, to Elaine's observation about extraordinary leadership in difficult times, I was listening to NPR News and they were saying that Countries that had a female leader during the pandemic actually fared better. And so there is plenty of evidence. So that's, you know, hard evidence that really kind of speaks to the topic and we're talking about it. So that's a big, big change. But then I, more importantly, what you do about it, right? And I feel sort of both from a culture and structural, structural obstacles from really women competing on a more level playing field, you know, they're all known these obstacles. And, pro and, you know, efforts are being made to address these. And while we still have a long way to go, I really do see progress uh, in, in the corporate world. And a few examples are like, you know, just like inclus inclusivity specific corporate protocols. It didn't exist when I entered, you know, the, the workplace. Today, um, you know, at the companies I work for, you know, they have implemented you know, hiring and uh, promotion procedures that really historically favored men. But today mm -hmm. they make sure that you actually have a diverse slate of candidates. And it's not just gender, but it's just that diversity. And you have to go through that process for all positions that be it new hires or or uh, all promotions. You know, that's another example. I do think there is a lot of education on unconscious bias, and that's really 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 important we all have that but we do have access to education and and, and that awareness is there we have a, more, a lot more allies as, as elaine pointed out and by the way it's always a great question to ask your male counterparts do they have a daughter so you kind of like <laughs> you nudge them uh, in a way and i also feel you know the structural uh, obstacles that i faced you know like be child care um, being the acceptance of working part-time and still pursuing a career, uh, you know, even culturally accepted. You know, my girlfriends used to say in Switzerland, why do you have children if you work? You know, I think that's all changing. And in an interesting way, I'm, I'm actually feeling really optimistic about particularly some of these structural changes about working from home or working part-time because the, uh, the pandemic has actually mm. shown to us that we have an ability to work from anywhere. And in fact, we're actually more productive and effective working mm -hmm. from home. And so it's gonna be much harder for corporations and bosses to push back on women who wanna have a bit more of a flexibility in terms of when they work and how they work so they can balance you know, raising children. So I feel really optimistic uh, about that actually. And then, you know, last but not least, which is it was a really important thing to me, was there were no, there are really no role models, as I mentioned, and we have definitely, but we're not where we need to be. We have a lot more role models today. So we have, uh, as, you know, advocates and sponsors, and sponsors are very important uh, as part of, you know, bringing, raising other women. And, and, and Madeline Albright, I saw her speak once, and she had this great line that stuck with me. She said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And so I feel in my role, and I'm sure Elaine and Chandra feel the same way, uh, Sharda, I feel the same way is, you know, we pay it forward. So our job is also to help younger women uh, that come into the workforce, you know, mentor them and mo more importantly, sponsor them and take a risk on them and give them uh, an opportunity to challenge themselves and prove themselves. So that's 
all, all those things have really changed significantly throughout my career. Wow, this is a this is a really upbeat panel. It's fantastic. Uh, I'm I'm very pleased to hear all these messages. I, I wanted to go back a little bit to uh, Serena's point about um, women and men's uh, you know well management styles, and I think uh, Elaine mentioned also this idea that women might be uh, have a propensity to collaborate and to influence uh, in you know more naturally. Uh, but it is true that we've heard a lot about, um, you know, how certain countries, well, I think the, the leading countries that, that are held up as examples of COVID being handled uh, quite well, uh, were majority uh, led by women. And so much has been said about that. I wanted to uh, turn to Elaine, not as an HR professional, but as someone who's recruited a lot of amazing executives and thus knows a lot about different leadership styles. Uh, Elaine, what are some differences in how men and women lead from your point of view? Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, there's an article in Harvard Business Review that did some statistical work recently that talked about how women are, are doing, um, uh, you know, so much better percentage wise on some key points in leadership. And some of those points um, are uh, in taking initiatives. Um, the learning agility, which is key. Whereas I would say, um, I don't know whether it's the nostalgia of saying this is how it's always been, whether it is a lack of effort to learn something new. I certainly see that that happened in the retail business when it came to e-commerce that's been around for 20 years. And the boards and the management have chosen to ignore it. And then they all go bankrupt this year and want to go, how come? Whereas if they had more agile um, e-commerce businesses, this wouldn't have happened. Well, women, women inspire. They inspire when they lead. And um, I, I see that happening in conversations. Um, they develop people. To Serena's point, um, I love that Madeline Albright saying, um, and I think it should actually be said more often because there are some women and I, generationally things change. Young women today that are 10 years into a career see things differently than another woman 20 years, another woman 30 years, and then with my group 40 years ago on how women interact with one another and look to lift one uh, each other up. So when um, in the 13, 1400 people I've recruited in my career, the majority of them have been women. And um, they, many of them are very self-reflective for a variety of reasons. Um, and they can take a look at themselves and say, what do I do well? What don't I do well? And with what I don't do well, how, how smart a group of people can I get around me so that we all work together? Um, women, I believe do better at relationships. The other thing too is, um, it, and, and I'm not saying it's, it's more male or female, but you, women maybe for whatever reason have great listening skills. And uh, I have seen the best executives and the best leadership have those listening skills, have those processing skills. They don't necessarily have to walk into a room and be the smartest person at the table right away. And on top of it, tell you that they are the smartest person at the table. And, um, I, and, I, and I see that, that collaboration that women have and the nurturing ability. And some of the best female leaders I've seen, and I certainly, I, lo I love to use people as an example, um, and but I don't want to mention names because they may or may not mean, mean anything to anybody, but they've uh, been uh, extraordinary. I've recruited a number of women who come out of Procter and Gamble. And I think before they even let you into that company, they must do some kind of psychological testing because the individuals that go in there are sharing a collaborative, uh, very smart individuals. And as they grow in the organization, uh, continue with those skill sets. And if they decide to leave, as many people do, for bigger and better opportunities, they take those skill sets with them and bring that uh, collaboration, the integrity, the relationship building, 
and with complete the eye on driving results in the business, because that is obviously, uh, you know, I hate to use the word, but it's a scorecard, you know, towards success in your career. So I don't know if I've answered your question, because if there are young men listening, I, I don't want you to think that there isn't an opportunity, because I do believe today that young men are honing in on those same skills that they now observe in women. And I think, again, a lot of it is truly generational. They're very insightful. And yeah, that is definitely something that we try to teach here at the Welch College of Business and Technology, too, is, is what we sometimes call soft skills, but what we start to call persistent skills. Uh, these are skills which are transferable that you take with you. Uh, they're not something you keep in your desk. And they include things like listening, multitasking, collaborating, nurturing. Uh, and, and those can be, there's, there's a whole spectrum, right? It's not, it's not male versus female. There's, you know, it's just like, um, you know, we, we, we all tend to be more or less a certain way. You can be within that and some of it is learnable, right? Uh, so it was very interesting observations. I, I want to just signal that at four o'clock, we're going to open it up for 10 minutes of question and answer. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to turn to, uh, to Sarina. Uh, you know, when you listen to Elaine and, and to, you know, when she talks about these skills that um, women have in, in terms of management, um, how do you um, think that applies when you look at how you motivate uh, your team, you know, even if there are conflicts and challenges, uh, how do you keep them, uh, on, you know, motivated and on point? And then how do you generate great ideas in an organization? I mean, what we've heard is kind of collaborating, multitasking, listening, but, but how do you Make, take it to the next level, not just keep it where it is. You said, um, Elaine, and those are all critical leadership skills. Ultimately, as a leader, I think you're, you, you need to be a great communicator. And, and, and the best advice mm -hmm. I can give to everyone is like, you know, be genuine, be yourself. And so if you want to build an organization and inspire, you know, teamwork and, and, and great collaboration, you really need to paint the, a, a vision of the future. And it has to be compelling and you have to communicate that as a leader, you know, communicate, communicate, and communicate in a way that employees can relate to it and say, yes, you know, I believe in that vision. And yes, I trust her or him to take me to that vision. And, and you know, it really uh, leadership is, is to me is very much about listening and then about really communicating. And that's been my experience uh you know, I, I tended to go into organizations where I turned around the businesses and completely changed strategies. And it was always about first communicating, hey, here is where we're going and here's how we're going to get there. And then you kind of uh, rally the people behind you. And it, the most important part is just be genuine and, and, and be passionate about mm -hmm. what we do. And then in terms of, you know, how do you generate great ideas? Um, empower empower your team let them let you know people the best ideas come from unexpected places so you have to create an environment where people feel comfortable raising ideas even if they're different or you know uh, if they're controversial and i've always created that sort of open environment constructive challenge and that is so critical and then set short-term targets that people can achieve and they feel good about success and then success builds um, on on success, uh, that's that's been my experience. We've done some fun things like you know putting stretch goals in, but in, in ninety days, and and really have the teams kind of own it and and really but empower them to go and do whatever it takes to get those goals done, and and that kind of unleashes a lot of the organizational energy and passion. Uh, you know, I um, before coming here to Sacred Heart, I taught at uh, Harvard Business School, and one of my colleagues there has done a lot of uh, research on, on how to get great teams to work together. And you just basically summed up her main theory, which is that cognitive diversity is key. So you, you need to let, you know, make people uh, who are, are very different, comfortable around you. And that's the second piece of psychological safety. So making sure that you bring on board and you keep on board people who think very differently from you and that you appreciate them, and then you create an environment where they're, they feel psychologically safe enough to say things that are unexpected. Their heads are not gonna get cut off, right? 
Uh, so it's very, very interesting. In, uh, sure. in that, yeah. that vision is really important in it because you'll have, you'll bump in, you know, obstacles and there'll be bump along the way or in, along the way, but then you have to just, if the team knows where they're going, they, go, they will jump that hurdle and keep, you know, running towards that vision. I think that's really important as part of that. So they can kind of stay focused. Great. So, you know, Sharda, I wanted to turn it over to you for the last uh, question before we open it up for Q&A. And you shared earlier, Sharda, this amazing attitude that you had throughout your career of basically embracing change regularly. Just when you're getting comfortable, you're the queen of, of tax accounting or ta tax audit. Uh, now you're going to say, oh, now I'm going to go do something completely different. So you obviously have this very, you know, I embrace change. Uh, I reinvent myself every few years. How does that play out once you retire after a 37-year career as a senior partner? And I, and I want to add, um, not only were you, and I do have to brag about you, Sharda, sorry, not only were you class valedictorian here, but you then got the highest score on the CPA exam in all of Connecticut. Then you go on and become the first uh, female Indian, uh, Indian female, I think, partner uh, nationwide. So you've done all these amazing things. What happens when you leave? this company where you've spent 37 years, how do you reinvent yourself now? How do, how do you continue to develop yourself as a leader? You know, this thing about um, uh, doing well in the exam and doing, you know, uh, class valedictorian, I think it had a lot to do with the teachers at Sacred Heart. I, I, I should have mentioned that, you know, Bob Kelly, whole boatload of teachers at, at Sacred Heart that taught me to think then, you know, I'd come from the very disciplined uh, sort of school environment in India that had given me a great education. But you land here in Sacred Heart and you have all these teachers that get you to think differently and the liberal arts education I got. And it was like a, it was a field day I was having because I was learning just philosophy that, you know, I'm not a philosopher, but I was learning about philosophy and religion and obviously calculus and accounting and everything else. So that whole combination made it made it. Um, I think a very valuable learning experience for me. And, uh, you know, this in this next chapter, uh, you know, I want to continue the whole thing. It's, uh, to me, I've started in kindergarten again. Getting on public boards isn't as easy. Everyone's told me that it was, isn't that as easy that, as we think, right? However, uh, what, what triggers me on is what's sort of been the catalyst, and Elaine and I have talked about this, is I've sort of honed down into sort of, what do I really um, care about? And what, 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 what sort of drives me? What, what is it that speaks to my soul? And there are four vectors. And again, it's all about learning. It's not like I know a whole lot about them, but I want to start again, um, relearning uh, in a lot of different areas. But um, the four vectors that I think personally are sort of the future of what, what drives me and what I think will drive mankind, education. Um, it just energy sustainability, food, alleviating poverty, food, and again, uh, agri-tech, for example, and healthcare. Healthcare, Elaine touched on it. So these four with a technology backbone in all of them that drives each one of them is what drives me. Now, what I'm looking to, uh, to learn again is, is more boards in that area and healthcare to me speaks a lot to my heart especially with what we've seen and i mean the journey continues um who knows what's gonna happen five years from now but but today i just feel like i need to and i i i'm on two boards and i love that because it just gives me i'm surrounded by people who know things that are so different than i do and when, when they ask questions, when I listen, when I learn, it's just like it's it's I'm like in a candy store, uh, just listening to a lot of this stuff and under and and hearing about certain level at a strategic level at companies. So I look at this and say, you know, chapter two is going to be, I think, more exciting than chapter one. And I'm looking forward to it. I love the change. It's totally different than what I was doing. Uh, but it but it takes into account a, a lot of what what I've learned over the years and and working with people and everything else. So it's going to be fun. Thank you. Well, all three of you are are just amazing examples for our students uh, of you know life lifelong learning and this attitude of of embracing change, embracing the future, and really uh, accepting the challenge, um, but also choosing to challenge yourselves. 
uh, over and over. So I'd like to open it up uh, for questions now because I promised uh, 10 minutes of Q&A. And I, I think it's going to be um, communicated. Ah, voila, I have a few questions already from the audience. Uh, first one is, what do you think for graduates entering the workforce is the, the most uh, important, what are the most important qualities for graduates who are entering the workforce? Elaine, maybe you want to start? Um, the ability to communicate. The young people today are looking at this. They're like this all the time. Okay. And the ability to communicate your ideas in a succinct fashion with a point of view um, is going to be very critical. A learning, open mind. I mean, that's, you know, today that is so uh, critical uh, to, to, to success. And that's what people are looking for. You know, people who have an interest show passion. You know, if you take on a, a, a new role, and, and that's what we look for in people is, are they passionate about it? Because then success will take care of itself. If you do something that you don't like, you're not going to be successful at it. Excellent. The next question is a little bit, it's also about skills, but it's directed mainly to uh, Sarina and Charda. What do you think is the most important skill now to learn? And this is a technical skill. Uh, for business in finance? Uh, would it be machine learning, cybersecurity, something else? Really a technology base. So it's, it's sort of broader. If you think about how the world's going to change, it has to be the breadth of technology. It's not only about machine learning. I mean, one can go you know, 40,000 feet deep in areas, but having the the ability to cut across is really important. It's great to be a great technology expert, but at the end of the day, something. So having this tech and business combination and having the breadth of what you can actually do and how things actually work and get applied to become, I think, more and more criti critical. So you know, uh, some of each, I'd say, you know, don't, don't silo yourself into one thing. It just would be my my approach, but I'm sure there are different ways to do it. Kind of a technological literacy, where where you, you you know how to do a little bit of coding, you know how to do do data analysis, a little bit of each, so that you're able to maneuver. You know, you kind of have to keep uh, an open mind, right? And you don't actually know as you go into your career what you're gonna like. I I didn't know I was gonna. I always wanted to have a career in finance because that's what I thought I liked, and I realized I'm a much better CEO. So just keeping an open mind and and you know that learning and 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 you know actually business is not that hard. It's a lot of common sense, and and so you know just you know use your brain and keep an open mind and try and connect the dots uh, is is definitely very very important. Excellent. The, the next question is about networks. Uh, several of you mentioned the importance of building an ecosystem, of having a network. And the question is really, how much does your network help you to advance? And for someone starting, how do you build that network? Elaine? Well, the first well, network first... is uh, from your college. Um, so I have been a big proponent, in fact, at Sacred Heart, the year I graduated in 1980, we had the first, um, forget what we called it, um, it was a career day at night for the MBA students. And we had all the professors invite friends, you know, other ind industry executives. For myself, I was still at Springs Industries. So I invited my boss who was eventually became president of Springs and went on to other presidencies and spoke to the graduate students because everybody that was in the MBA program at Sacred Heart, including me, was looking to build up financial and accounting skill sets that we could take, take us into other industries that we felt we would have a better chance at advancing our careers. So the first network is school. Um, that and the other advantage that students have is the social network. You can go on LinkedIn, particularly, and in that they invite you to a, a whole group of uh, industry focused networking organizations. And some of them are very, very happy to accept young people. 
I think the key to success, if you want to kind of, um, you know, have a career to a C-suite and be a CEO is, you know, I, I always sum it down to like three or four things. One, when you enter the career, and I'm digressing a little bit for the question, I apologize, but one is, uh, is you got to get P&L responsibility earlier in your career. Otherwise, it's just really hard to move into a CEO job. And uh, the second one is really, we talked a lot about this in this topic, is your, your you know, your willingness to, or you demonstrate that you're willing to take risk. And then the third one is you do need to build a really strong network around you. And there is no, you know, one answer as to how to do this. Uh, but I do think it's critically important. And the network includes mentors. Uh, you need a sponsor and a sponsor is really critical. A sponsor is someone, a mentor is someone who helps you guide and make decisions. A sponsor is someone who's willing to take a risk on you and gives you an opportunity. So that needs to be part of your network. And then as Elaine said, you need your, your peer network and that, and that helps you for opportunities, but also for support. Everybody needs support. And, and so those are really, really critical sort of elements in, in your career as you enter you know, the workforce that you should think about early on. I wish that somebody had told me that as I entered the career, I was lucky enough to just kind of stumble upon these things in my career, but I wish somebody had told me and guided me a little bit along the way. Excellent advice. So get P&L responsibility, demonstrate an appetite for risk, and then also build your strong network, including a sponsor and a mentor and then your peers. Uh, very helpful. Um, I wonder, Sharda, you know, you told us about your story of leaving your home country when you're 17, 18 years old, moving here, ending up uh, being a grocery clerk in order to kind of learn American culture. How did you build your network as you progressed in your career? Uh, you know, what? <laughs> um, it's never uh, too early to, uh, to everyone's point to build a network, right? And, and, uh, and to me, a network is a lot about, you know, giving. Right. It's all about investing and, and that, you know, whoever it is, if you don't keep up with them, it sort of gets cold and yeah, they might help you. But but at the end of the day, over the, the years, you have to sort of keep up. And I'll tell you on my board journey that I've been on, I was telling someone about this the other day I started with, who do I let know? And there were 150 people that I had to let know up front. Hey, I'm, I, I'm looking for boards is what I need, etc. But I drew upon uh, probably 30 years of people that I knew to reach out to them. And now that little spreadsheet is 1400 people because every single person sending me like five different places to, to talk to people. And it's sort of the law, large numbers and things happen. But, but I think what I've done, and I've been pretty I'd say religious about this throughout my career is I've kept up with people, you know, whether it's a little Mother's Day message that goes out or a Father's Day message that goes out or whatever goes out over the years. There's a lot of people in my sort of ecosystem over the years that I've nurtured uh, in different ways. You can't put the same amount of effort in everything, but there's a very large set of people that I can count on today for literally anything. And that to me, is just phenomenal, right? And and um, yeah, so I've just invested in and in small things, you know. And you know, luckily at EY, you know, when you're in an organization with two hundred eighty thousand people around the world and lots and lots and lots of clients, you're like it's uh, it's a field day in networking. Yeah. So right. Quick, I can yeah. attest to what Sharda just said because as part of um, her outreach. I was part of it on her list and yes, her and I yes, met yes, previously yes. Um, yes. Uh, and she has exactly done what she said. She's been in touch all that time. So we knew each other even before we went on this panel. So it's right. kind of nice to see. Right. Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually, I think we've kind of come full circle on this topic because we started off talking about risk taking and a couple of you mentioned, you know, that, that part of risk taking and overcoming obstacles is constructing a, a network around you or an ecosystem around you and building up a reservoir of trust. And in fact, uh, studies have shown that trust is actually built up over those little things that you talked about, because they may seem like little things, but they're actually really big. Uh, and <clears throat> I was listening to a podcast the other day uh, exactly about this, and they were talking about some recent research, and they were saying that, in fact, showing up for funerals is one of the things that builds trust, believe it or not. Uh, and, and just responding, remembering the little things, uh, being there consistently, 
uh, it shows people that you're that you're part of their life and and that you can be relied on. So it's funny. Sometimes we think it's only the big things, but it's actually uh, quite often the small ones. Well, I am so grateful uh, to all three of you uh, for being a part of our ecosystem, of, of our community, and for taking this time to share your perspectives and your wisdom and your advice uh, with our students and with our faculty um, and with our partners in the community. Uh, we look forward to more events like this, and we're very, very grateful uh, for you staying in touch with us, and we look forward to uh, more opportunities like this. Thank you very much. It's been such a pleasure, such an inspiration. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.